They mostly come at night. Mostly. Well, on a Monday, uh, June 23rd, 2014, a balmy Florida evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Primetime Paranormal, uh, the best in paranormal talks, discussions, debates, arguments, and uh, sometimes humor on the side as well. Uh, my name is George Lopez. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Way to start off your work week the right way, right here with Primetime Paranormal with myself and uh, my partner in crime from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. He is the Ron Burgundy of the Paranormal, Mr. Michael Bowler. And uh, how are you doing this evening, sir? How was your weekend? Outstanding. Outstanding. I uh, woke up with uh, uh, heavy rain uh, Sunday and Monday, but got my golf came in Saturday, and uh, we're experiencing what I call uh, May-type uh, weather here in June in Texas, which means we're probably going to have a hot September, so there's your psychic weather prediction I uh, hear from Texas on what's going on. <laughs> yeah, How are you? all around. Everybody's getting hit with storms right now, really, really bad, and, uh, you know, we've got uh, at least – three more months of this that we have to contend with. But, you know, I've said this before, and, and, you know, your temperatures become really beautiful also. I know when I was down there with you guys uh, that one March, the weather was just perfect and uh, a little chilly in the morning, but still beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's the sacrifice we make for living down south, Mike, right? Because you get three or four months of hot weather. The rest of the time, it's absolutely gorgeous. That's true. Yeah, that beats the uh, the six months of, of, of gray overcast I hear is up north. Uh, from about October to May, uh, for everybody that uh, is up uh, in the northern part of our uh, ghost hunting areas. <laughs> yeah, which is in full swing right now because this is the best time of the year uh, that they'll actually get a chance to um, go and investigate all the historically haunted places up in the northeast and northwest uh, before they start getting snowed in again and uh, it's, uh, or it gets too cold. But I think they usually end up at the beginning of November is when they conclude a lot of the different festivals that go on up there. And uh, as a matter of fact, a whole bunch of our friends went to Fort Mifflin this weekend, and uh, one of our friends, Bridget Good, she'd be calling in the second hour a little bit, talking about that uh, that adventure. But uh, the, the, the entire weekend was basically called dodging the bugs. So because it's just they're just dealing with it just as much with the warm weather up there, and the, and the bugs realize just like the humans do that there's a limited amount of time to get out there and really. Uh, enjoy the weather, so they're out in droves right now, and again, this fort, there's a lot of outside investigating being done, so uh, very, very difficult, but uh, she'll be calling a little bit later on also. Uh, welcome to Primetime Paranormal, part of the Dead Air Paranormal family of shows here on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, tonight, what I thought about doing is, uh, you know, we've been on a serious, at least myself, Mike, I've been on this serious crusade lately, uh, almost on a soapbox when we've done our Monday shows about uh, the spirit phenomena and the things that we're doing in this community and you know, whether it's futile or not. And it's been very, very serious. I wanted to make a lighthearted night tonight, talk about a different topic, uh, which is UFOs, something that uh, we don't discuss very often. Uh, on Tuesday nights of World Awakening with Andrew Perrin and myself, we've had a bunch of wonderful guests uh, in regards to that topic. But, you know, I think we could stretch our brains a little bit tonight uh, and, and not go down the same path. And and see what our thoughts are in regards to um, alien communication and contact and the things that historically that have happened and, uh, you know, what's going on today out there as far as the uh, uh, the sightings, the experiences that people are having uh, with uh, alien contact. So uh, it should be an interesting ride. We've got a bunch of people are going to be calling us tonight, hopefully, if you would uh, like to join in the conversation. Uh, the number to call in is one six four six. Nine two nine two three eight four. That's one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. Email address radio show dead air at gmail dot com. And I got I got to keep a track on that too because been a couple of shows where I gave the Gmail address and end of the show I look up there to check my mail and there's, sure enough there's two or three questions people had for our guests. So I got to keep a uh, diligent eye on that tonight as well. Uh, Mike, you had about two weeks off, and uh, this uh, other gentleman had about two weeks off. One was for technical issues. Uh, we're hoping that they've been resolved uh, tonight. Last week, uh, he was in Sydney, Australia, and uh, doing some documentary filming over there, and we're happy to have him join us back uh, on our Monday broadcast. And, of course, i got to give him his uh, little intro there as well. Ashley Hall, are you there, and can we hear you? Let's hope you can. <laughs> you got success, 
Six seconds of a little applause behind that. We actually can hear you for the first time. So good. Oh, my God. What a nightmare. <laughs> what the hell was that all about? Did you ever figure out the problem? I have no idea. So I've got, like, this nice mixing desk in front of me and nice microphones and everything's plugged up professionally. And, of course, you know, the multi-thousand dollar system doesn't work, so I've just got it simply plugged into my tablet PC and it's working fine. So, I don't know, go figure. <laughs> well, uh, we thank you for joining us tonight. I know uh, this is something that's of a fascination for you also. We've discussed this in the past, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to death that you're joining us tonight, my friend. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to talking a bit about UFOs. That's really what first really got me into the paranormal field. So, yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit about that. And uh, joining us also, uh, he was with us the last week when we were doing, a again, a very uh, goal-oriented panel about the direction of this field uh, by the show hosts that are out there, the different show hosts in the paranormal community. Uh, this is the gentleman, the founder of Paranormal Geeks Radio, Mr. Jim Heater, joining us tonight for this discussion. And, Jim, uh, I know it was last minute for you uh, when I contacted you, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on tonight, my friend. Hey, no problem. It's uh, better than watching the... Uh the weather come in and the uh, severe flood warning we're under. Oh, God. Where are you at again? Where are you stationed out of? About 130 miles straight south of Chicago in Champaign, Illinois. Oh, geez, yeah. So you, you, you're going to have to deal with a lot of this weather the same as we are, too. Yeah, I saw that whole front oh, yeah. coming through the press, so... Uh, but, uh, gentlemen, you know, I wanted to bring this up in topic tonight, something we don't normally talk about on our Monday shows. It's usually about uh, the paranormal community from the aspect of spirit phenomena. And, and uh, like I said, I've been on a crusade for too long of a time, so I wanted to change gears, change directions here. And, Mike, you and I have had probably uh, as many off-air discussions about this as we had on air, probably more. But uh, you know, we kind of dismiss this aspect of the field because it's, you know, the way that you and I have called it before, if it's tangible, uh, it's going to be on the 6 o'clock news because this is something that is, uh, uh, I mean, we've seen movies about this almost for this entire uh, uh, 20th century and also the 21st century now, but it's always been kind of portrayed as an invasion, very rare except in this aspect of Steven Spielberg uh, or the movie Paul and such as that where, uh, they are benign uh, species. Usually, they're here to take over the world. On that, uh, what are your thoughts, Mike? You know the existence. I mean, you're, you've been extremely vo for, uh, vocal lately as far as uh, being very skeptic in the community as far as spirit phenomena and what's going on. But as far as UFOs, where do you stand? I, I think that uh, uh, you have to look at it for just exactly what it is that uh, the universe that we uh, live in. Uh, you know, space as we know it, uh, with what scientists have been able to uh, uh, discover up to 2014, up to date, and uh, I, I'm not greatly educated on this, but as you know, I'm, I'm a huge one, watch Cosmos, uh, watch a lot of the scientific shows, big fan of the Science Channel, uh, and, and have, you know, slowly educated myself through entertainment type uh, shows, Discovery Channel, and things like that, that to say that there is not a possibility of something intelligent being out there is uh, absolutely ridiculous that we don't know uh, at this point if contact has ever been uh, established with anything, uh, whether they have tried. Uh, maybe they have, and we don't even know what they are. And I think that's where I go a lot of times in discussions with this is, is that I think Ben Hansen came on one night, and we dabbled in this uh, talk just a little bit, that uh, may have been with Kool-Aid with Chris Medina on Wednesday. But uh, as he said, he said, you know, are, are, why are we looking in the sky? You know, who says we have to look to the sky? to find UFOs. Why can't we look in the water? Why can't we look in the ground? Who knows if something uh, extraterrestrial uh, shows up here on the planet uh, that it's going to come, just like you said, George, uh, the same way we've seen them come in the movie. Um, <clears throat> that we don't know, and I think as, as technology in the paranormal field advances uh, with different creatures, with Bigfoot, you know, with ghosts and, and, and spirits and the investigations that people do there, uh, that the UFO field, I think, will grow in leaps and bounds as the technology advances and what we're dealing with in uh, discovering things that uh, uh, were not a part of this planet at one time and, and trying to figure out maybe how it got here. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of controversial uh, topics with Area 51 in New Mexico and the, the government hiding things, and you have your 
uh, conspiracy theories uh, that I think probably do more harm than good when it comes to uh, ufology. But uh, I think it's an absolutely fascinating field, and at times you've heard me uh, say to you in our private conversations that I can almost in my brain tie in Bigfoot, uh, UFOs, aliens, ghosts, and spirits into the same thing and say, what if they are all within the same? Uh, and, and that's something that I think maybe we could touch on tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Ashley, as you spoke of, I mean, that was the catalyst for you getting into the field of the paranormal to where now you're a tour guide at a haunted location uh, in Australia. But uh, give us, uh, again, the, the story of your fascination with ufology to begin with. Yeah, I guess uh, it began when I turned about 18, 19 years old. So I was, you know, I had a very heavy interest in the paranormal and I was talking about this one night and someone that was sitting across the table from me basically just told me their UFO experience. And it was quite an interesting, I guess, close encounter. And I went from there and just looking further and further into what happened to him and then I found out his family members had other things. So I asked them about it and basically just grew from there, just people finding out that I was interested in hearing their stories. And uh, they would just contact me and I I had a a lot and a lot of case notes. And uh, I'd probably, you know, interviewed well over 100 people. And the catalyst that kind of changed from me being into UFO to more ghosts and hauntings was I moved house and I lost all my case notes. Everything was gone. Well over 100 people interviewed you know, lots of uh, night vigils, lots of sightings, lots of maps, things like that. All of that was gone. It kind of, um, I guess, yeah, it kind of upset me a bit, so I kind of just moved in a new direction. But those, those that decade was, was very interesting and quite opening for me uh, in in regards to the, I guess, just the, the, the wide range of people that are having encounters and seeing these objects all, all well, for me, across South Australia, but also across the world. You find yourself uh, a lot of the times, uh, Jim Heater, uh, in this community where there seems to be a lot of the, this, this crossover pattern that goes on with people who are doing paranormal investigating who will from time to time, and I just recently had that experience myself going to the same location you did in Chicago, uh, the Star Wars Symposium, uh, which was spearheaded and organized by uh, uh, an amazing lady who, you know, for all intents and purposes, is the voice of the UFO community, uh, Paula Vasquez. Uh, you know, we look at uh, what we're doing a lot of the times in this uh, to see a uh, a pattern of connection. As Mike was talking about just a little bit earlier, are we looking at the same thing? Are we experiencing perhaps besides sphere phenomena, multidimensional creatures, and possibly even alien contact? with a lot of the electronic devices that we may be um, confusing as uh, former people that are now in spirit form may actually be not even uh, terrestrial to this planet? Did we lose Jim? No, I'm here. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I didn't know that was uh, directed towards me. I'm sorry. Uh, not at all. Go ahead. It's, it's a very good possibility. Uh, yeah, and I had never really thought about that, and so I, w- I can't remember who I was talking to up there at the, uh, at the symposium, and uh, kind of brought that to light. And I brought it forward to some of my other my ghost hunting friends, and they kind of, ha ha, that's interesting, and just kind of get swept under the rug. But you know, you just have to keep such an open mind in this field that you you can't let anything, you know, not, not at least think about it for a half hour or before you make such a rash decision. It puts us in a perspective a lot of the times. You know, for myself, now it's the same thing. I I, uh, I sat at this event uh, in Chicago, as you did, Jim, and there were a bunch of lecturers out there, and I found it comparable to uh, the spirit phenomena community, uh, the ghost hunters, uh, that it was people telling ghost stories and showing their pictures or uh, pictures of other evidence that they've seen out there. Uh, but the difference is is that by proxy, by the uh, the capability that it's there in its existence, I'm talking about places where we can investigate, um, I'm just not seeing that much. Now, I don't watch any of the UFO shows, and I think Mike 
you've kind of gone all up and down the, the dial, the TV dial, to, uh, boy, that, that's dating me there, <laughs> saying that, but when you would go and look at some of these you know, Bigfoot shows or UFO shows, and they seem to be out there in the field, but you know, are they doing it in the same fashion, format, and way that we would be doing things from what you would see? I mean, they're using night vision goggles. We use night vision goggles. They're using audio equipment, um, uh, like the parabolic dish. We use that in our investigations. Uh, photography, videography, things of that notion. But are, are are they seeing the same results? And are they mis uh, misnaming things that are going on? Are, are they calling things uh, UFOs that aren't UFOs that are out there that could be possibly satellites, uh, weather balloons? It does the old uh, Amish that the people would talk about too. But is there a possibility that um, the, the parallels are so similar? And we're still not getting the groundwork done that we need to in either one of the communities? If the groundwork's being done, it's not put on TV. And I think that's the magic word there, uh, going up and down the dollar, scanning uh, with the remote uh, through the cable box of the 9 million channels that we now have, half of them coming from outer space, as we say. Um, that that's it, George. That most of the ones that I've watched there, they're, they're looking at light phenomena, uh, which a lot of times are weather balloons, are satellites. Uh, a, a lot of times... Uh, some of the people, some of the sites I've been to that debunk will show uh, shows and, and uh, uh, different paranormal UFO events that are seem to be scientifically unexplained. That uh, I believe I can't remember the actual website, just that he can explain 99% of them by looking at the satellite. Uh, uh, basically, when they drop and move, uh, the satellites that are moving at night for repositioning uh, that are generated, and I think it's free to most people to get the uh, a readout of their uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, and he says this corresponds a lot of times with these sightings. But it makes for great television. You've got people going out <clears throat> to uh, Arizona, uh, some in Texas, New Mexico, some of the hot spots. If you're going to make a TV show, uh, you need to have a compelling story for your audience, and this is what they're doing. It's not that they're not doing good work. Uh, they're simply doing work that is uh, going to please the producers and the television channel, uh, keep the listeners uh, or, or watchers involved in it, by uh, showing uh, things that really are, are quite odd in the sky as lights up here for no reason, uh, not that anybody can explain. Uh, with today's technology, with the telescopes, binoculars, uh, you know, uh, they can see things uh, that uh, we could see years back. Uh, and, and, and these phenomena, they go on over and over, and, and you know, it's, it's easily explained. Uh, a lot of the groundwork, as you're talking, that's done uh, with ufologists uh, around the country uh, you know, a lot of the work that they're doing in soil samples, uh, talking about finding different areas uh, of reported activity and testing the soil samples, finding uh, large amounts of EMF and, and radiation in areas that they can't explain why it was there, uh, other than some government conspiracy of something that was there from the Air Force uh, that they wouldn't know about, uh, basically does not make the cut for TV, so we don't hear or know a whole lot about that unless we talk to somebody is heavily involved in the research herself. I want to uh, make a, a quick apology and uh, restate also the uh, the organizer for the uh, Starworks uh, Symposium in Chicago we went to a couple of months back is uh, Paula Harris, and uh, again, giving credit to somebody who uh, orchestrated this and brought uh, together some of the great minds in this field. And I heard a lot of different things during this particular conference, and um, what I'd like to do is kind of a quick rapid fire with uh, with Mike, with Ashley, and with Jim. And Ashley, we'll start with you. I'm going to bring up one particular topic uh, about the mythology of UFOs. And uh, tell me what your thoughts are. Is it real? Is it fake? Or is it a little bit of both uh, where people are, uh, are involved with uh, creating false positives? We'll start with uh, you, Ashley. Crop circles. Uh, crop circles. Um, yeah, I guess. That's an interesting one. I guess for a while there, and when they were really first starting to turn up in the, I guess what sixties, seventies, and eighties, people were you know really into it. But it was found out fairly early on that there were there were basically two or three guys that were responsible for quite a few of them across Europe, um, going out with their boards and stomping down. But there are so many crazy patterns in them, like basket woven effects and all sorts of strange things that make it seem like. You know, there's got to be a bit more work going into it than someone with a, a rope and a board stomping through some fields. So are they tied to UFOs landing or just leaving messages? I'm not sure, but there's certainly something interesting to look at. Mr. Jim Heater, 
Crop circles. Uh, I uh, was pretty much a skeptic on the uh, crop circles until I had a guest on on my show, and I cannot like me remember her name. I might remember it later on. But uh, allegedly, there's a well, there is a video out on YouTube about one. It shows one being made by a ball of light. Uh, mm-hmm. Ball of light going spinning around the field, and it lays it out. Uh, oh sure. I thought that, that was a hoax, and I told her that. And she really explained it really well why it wasn't a hoax. But you know, I, I agree with Ashley. It, I, I can't see where you'd have a couple guys sitting around the pub uh, going out and getting some boards and some uh, rope and deciding to do some sort of pattern. Some of these are so intricate, and it, they, they mean that they actually have some sort of meaning to them. They can actually be read by either some sort of hieroglyphics or some sort of uh, chemical symbol, something. So I'm getting more and more into it, but I think there's a lot easier to uh, leave a, me- a lot easier way to leave a message than uh, going around flagging a lot of wheat. Mr. Bowler, you know, if it were some sort of a hoax, uh, I mean, I consider you to be uh, one of the most intelligent people that I know that, I, that, I've, that I've ever known, and. You know, you, you've got a rational way of thinking about things, but a logical way, too. Uh, and, and some of these designs are, are, as Jim just said, so intricate and can only really be seen from the sky. Uh, and when they have these geometric shapes that are perfectly designed, uh, I mean, could you be able to, even to get ten of your friends together and be able to figure out how to get something like that done in one night? Depending on what kind of drugs we had, George. Well, that's, yeah. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I'm right there with you. I, I mean, this is one, one, once again, this is something we don't know. And as we're talking about this, this is why I love these shows and being a part of this. Why have we not done more research on this? What I would love to, to have right now is somebody to just research this. They could say, these started in 1981 or whatever. The first one was spotted, you know, that we knew about uh, since we've been keeping history of these things. Uh, and then they went along for three or four years and then stopped, which would lead us to two explanations. Uh, that the guys at the bar got bored and quit doing that, or, you know, they got caught and said, I gig up, it's not fun anymore. Uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe there were some copycats, if, if, if that's the case. Or whoever was visiting got what they came for and, and left. I mean, you, you can look at it two ways. Uh, how long is this one going on? You know, when, when you see news stories like this, I always wonder what their shelf life was. Uh, I haven't seen anything about crop circles. Is it an ongoing thing? Uh, you know, you could tie it into cattle mutilations and things like that, uh, which, you know, that's another subject we get into uh, about that. But I, I don't know. It doesn't make any logical sense that if something was going to travel to this planet and do such what we're assuming is a wonderful job of covering their tracks and making sure that, we're not aware they're here, that there's no communication, that they sneak in and sneak out. But yet they forgot to turn around and where they parked their ship, they left a big, you know, hey, well, they won't figure it out. They'll blame some guy in the bar for it. Um, <laughs> you know, it just it, it doesn't make any sense, like, like you said. But what I would like to know more about is, is that one of the things that I think where the community fails itself is – that is very interesting, and, and it is paranormal because we really scientifically have not explained what caused them. We don't know that it was the guys in the bars that did all of them, but we haven't researched it any further either. We just simply turn around and say, well, it could or it couldn't be, maybe because these guys did that. Who has taken the time, spent the money, and done the research to say this was the first one, and to the best of our knowledge, this was the last one, and we haven't had one since that's been reported? Why are we not there? That's the kind of research this community needs to be doing. There's another portion of this, too, that um, seems to follow in the 12th monkey theory that uh, there's, you know, these particular designs, hieroglyphics, if you will, that are, you know, bore into wheat fields and otherwise that are international. They're global. So they they wind up in different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, is it a possibility that, you know, a copycat begins with the first ones that are out there and maybe the first ones are authentic and then, you know, as a trial, certain people get out there and try to see if they can't mimic and do the same thing as well. Uh, I mean, this started in the 60s and 70s. That there was no Internet, yeah. so it's hard to really get those broadcasts going to other countries. But the possibility that the ideas or the evolution of man came at the same time and they were all doing it at the same time is 
a rare possibility, but a possibility nonetheless. Um, let me jump to the next question for you, gentlemen. We'll go back, Ashley, to you is regards to uh, some of the theories that I've heard, particularly in the community, that there are uh, scores or at least uh, you know a dozen plus different alien species that already walk among us and are integrated into our society in the form of uh, a humanoid, um, similar enough to what we look like that they can pass as us. Your thoughts on that? Are there aliens walking among us? Well, and, uh, and, def- and honey boo boo doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I've definitely um, been exposed to those theories. Uh, back in my UFOlogy days, I joined a group who were heavily, I guess, into that side of thing. They were almost into the UFOlogy from a spiritual side. And, you know, I remember one evening some gentleman coming up to me, looking at my face, and he told me that I was half reptilian, half Pleiadian, which I was like, Whoa, but you know these these stories get get pretty out there. If you listen to people like um, David Icke and that, they they say some pretty controversial stuff, saying that there's reptilians in the British royal family, eviscerating young children, all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Uh, but as for my personal beliefs, I think if there are aliens out there, I, I dare say there would be different races. I, I guess there wouldn't just be one lot. Um, as for them walking amongst us, disguised as us. I don't know, but there's, you know, some interesting videos out there that explore those topics. Yeah, especially the lizardman aspect of it. And I've seen many of them. Yeah. And, uh, I remember sending me some YouTube uh, videos of that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've been all over this for, for a couple of years because people have been talking about it for a while. We had a guy who used to come uh, onto the show. Uh, his uh, chat name was Freak Mushroom, and he was all about conspiracies. And he sent a, a, a ton of that stuff. Uh, Scotty Roberts, uh, the editor-in-chief of Intrepid Magazine, uh, has been uh, following the lizard people for many, many, many years, and um, again, one of the most foremost experts on that. Um, Mr. Heater, you know, there's so much evidence in in ancient cultures relating to the potential possibility of alien visitors, and you know whether or not there was uh, cross uh, mating that was going on back in that time, and we do have. Uh, that kind of DNA even in our system. And, and Mike, we, we, that, this is going to come to you with the genetic memory part of it because are there codes that are embedded uh, as far as us that uh, maybe will at one point in time or another, almost like a sleeper agent, uh, trigger? And I'll get to you on that in a second. But uh, would you say the same thing, that uh, Jim, that uh, there are potentially uh, dozens of, of different species of life from other planets that are walking among us? I, I, the last thing I heard that there were 60, 60 to seven, sixty to seventy different species of uh, of alien. Um, you know, the, going from reptoid to uh, to the greys, the, you know, just they're, they're the runs the gamut. But uh, talking about controversial people in, in the uh, UFO world, um, last week, yeah, last week I had uh, Donald Ware on the show, and he was up there at Star Wars. Uh, didn't really get a good chance to talk to him, but I did get him on. Did get a chance to get him on the show, and he says that there are seven trillion, seven trillion planets that support a some sort of alien race on it in our in in, in all the universes. Um, so, and you know, and you know, you can't sit out on your porch at night and stare up at the sky. And not believe that we are the only the only ball with with life on it. Uh, but it's if they're here, uh, I do believe that they probably some have some sort of uh, shape shifting capability, uh, maybe even a cloaking type of capability. Heck, you know, there could be one uh, you know sitting and listening to us right now in, in one of our rooms. Uh, there's always that possibility. I'm, I'm open for anything. This is such an unknown area. <laughs> Mr. Bowler, uh, genetic memory, the potential aspect that there are there is alien DNA uh, that has been uh, a strain of our DNA for millennia, if not longer. A potential possibility, again, uh, that it triggers at one point in time or it's helped in the development of uh, mankind in a sense, would you have, think that, that that possibility truly exists as, along with 
you know, pure aliens existing on the planet with us. Well, if, if it is a part of us, then it's not alien DNA, is it? It, it uh, may be well, alien to our knowledge, but if it's a part of us that we just did not know, then it's a part of us and it's normal. That's interesting. Well, it's indigenous, it right? It's indigenous to us, but its origins or its origins are not indigenous. That's interesting. You bring that up. I, I would not say in my research that I found anything that went that way with you know the genetic memory and the DNA uh, makeup of people. Uh, but man, that that would be a fascinating uh, thing to research to see if we could get some people that might go there. I want to throw something out there. I always kind of go outside the box during these shows, and I just did just now with your question. Let's say that Ashley uh, in Australia, the reason he took the two weeks off, and he lets us know after the show, built a spaceship, and uh, uh, the four of us, including Jim, uh, George, we were all going to get on the spaceship. And uh, uh, he also discovered a way for us to be gone for just a week, but it was going to be like years for us to go to another planet. Uh, it was going to, we were going to be able to morph and, and fit in with their community. Uh, and we got there, and, you know, we're having the time of our life. It's been a couple of the years there, you know. Uh, Ashley got us there. I knew he could get us back home safely to do the show next Monday. Nobody would know about this. But while we're there in the two-year time-lapse period that we're there, uh, we decided just to pick a handful of individuals uh, throughout their community uh, that believe there may be something outside their uh, world and planet as well. Uh, and a few of them we expose ourselves and tell them, so you can't tell anybody else, and if the government hears you talking about this, you know, they're going to think you're wacko. And the government kind of knows about us because we have a friend in there and they know we're here, but they don't really do anything about it. It's all a big cover-up. That we probably wouldn't go that route. So we have to assume that if anything is existing, is rational and intelligent in the same form that we are, why would they be doing this? It doesn't make sense to me that they would only pick a handful of people in the ufology community or people that are now a part of it to say they've had contact with aliens. But yet they, you know, we're not going to prove it. And we don't really need to because they'll come out when the time is right. They're there. We know they're there. And they just hand selected a few people, knowing that nobody would really believe us if it mattered anyway. And that's kind of where we're at. Am I am I right? Well, this uh, is it, what you're talking it, about. What you're talking about did happen. You know the, the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. When near the end, where they had the uh, group of uh, volunteer volunteers that that went on the large craft at the end, that actually happened. Back, I believe it was in the early 60s, and it was called Project Serpo, S-E-R-P-O, where there were volunteers, uh, mostly, well, there, it's supposed to be all men. There might have been a couple women, but that went to Planet Serpo for like an exchange mission, and they came back in, the, in um, I believe it was 2001 or two, and there's still a few of them that are still alive. Uh, but this, this is actually, well, from what I've read, this has actually happened in, in the past. So you're saying that this is fact, not fiction? My understanding and what I've read is that it's, it's fact. I mean, of course, in everything, there are going to be a bunch of naysayers, uh, you know, in the paranormal community with ghosts and stuff. Oh, I don't believe in ghosts. Well, I don't believe in Planet Servo. But there's well, a lot they of actually, you know, do, Don't you think if they actually did this, they'd have so much to gain by bringing factual evidence and proof to the table, why would they not? Who says they haven't? Well, well yeah. I'm, I'm saying they haven't because we haven't seen it. Matt Lauer okay, hasn't yeah. had one of them on the Today Show. And what I'm saying is I, I, maybe they tried, but why would we shoot this down and we go into conspiracy theories once again? And I think in 2014, the conspiracy theories with the way the political environment is these days and people trying to uh, get voted into office, you, you almost can't say that everybody in the government will keep their mouth shut about this, but yet they will shoot each other in the foot across, uh, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats who are trying to ruin the other side with any and everything they can, but they all get together on the UFOs and keep their mouth shut. But it's, but it's not all government-based. A lot of this is the private industry is, uh, is Boeing, is... Uh, and, and I'm not saying not you're wrong here, but what what use would any private industry have in covering this up when they could profit handsomely by coming public? Well, they are they are profiting from it. How do how did we go from, from rotary phones to these small phones we can fit in our pockets and do anything with in in fifteen years? That's a great jump in technology. 
How do you're we saying nobody on so you're saying nobody on the planet had the knowledge or the wherewithal to pull that off that it had to come from outside. I'm saying, I'm saying we had help. Mm, I'm sure there's a lot of people over in Japan and China that would argue with you on that. <laughs> you don't think? <laughs> Probably right. Our uh, very special guest tonight, uh, the host of Paranormal Geeks Radio, uh, Mr. Jim Heater. Uh, the number to call in if you'd like to join the conversation, one six four six. Nine two nine two three eight four one six four six nine two nine two three eight four. That that begs the the topic of uh, and delving into this right now, conspiracy wise. I guess Ashley, it's something that uh, we're familiar with talking about the uh, spirit phenomena part of this community, but this falls into that same category. And Mike's bringing up a very very good point. Something that I've argued uh, in in opposition to him in the reasons why uh, this type of information, if it, if it was in existence. You know, the old, old saying, going back to the old Looney Tunes uh, story, take me to your leader, uh, the reason being is because they've got to make the ultimate decision on whether or not society as a whole is prepared for that type of information. In other words, whether Boeing went public, Lockheed went public, NASA went public, the government went public, in any capacity, um, society, as in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, but actually I want your opinion on it too, and, and, and of course Jim and, and and Mike also, but I don't think that, you know, if the first thing comes into play in every single one of these that concerns me, both in spirit phenomena and if ufology uh, were in existence in a public standpoint, the public at large is going to want to ask the main question, is there a God? That's going to be the main question. The technological advances, the medical advances, uh, even the aspects of what they could do with their minds that we've not reached yet would be secondary to the question of faith. Is there a God? Uh, would you believe, Ashley, that's one of the reasons why, if the information uh, does exist out there, that it's kept in, uh, in confidentiality because, as a society or as a species, we could not handle those answers? Yeah, I think I think uh, you know the the main religions in this world do have a fair bit of sway over what does happen, and yeah, those questions would come up. I, I remember I remember hearing it once that if aliens came down to show themselves to be real, you know that that question is going to come up: Is there a god? Is let's assume that I don't know, I don't even know how to say this, but you know, did did the aliens of their planet, did they have a Jesus, sacri- you know, die for their sins? You know, do, you know, there's just so much. Uh, do, do, do these aliens have a variety of religions within their own uh, races? Do they have a Christianity, Catholicism, uh, Jewism, Muslims? Do they, do they have all that themselves? And if not, what does that mean for, you know, the, gov- the governments and the religion, you know, the orders here? Um, I don't know, I'm kind of dancing around the subject, so I don't want to offend anyone at the same time. But, yeah, hopefully you understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jim, it's, you know, it falls into that category. I mean, if they come down and uh, the first thing they do is they, you know, they, they laugh and say, you know, the first of all, the Vatican's sweating, <laughs> you know. Uh, the, the, every different faith out there is just, uh, you know, on the edge of their seat because of the gl- the global leaders uh, in whichever denomination, religious denomination uh, that they are in charge of are going to be sweating because they're not going to know the answers. Or, Jim, would you think that those religious leaders would also be notified if this was, again, first government ruled uh, and then globally ruled by leaders, that those leaders would have to be involved also because those decisions would impact them financially, socially, and uh, and, of course, from the faith-based, if it no longer existed, uh, what that would cause for all of their parishioners worldwide. Well, one thing is that I, I honestly believe that the Vatican knows more, probably more about the alien life or what is going on up, up there, out there, under us, wherever it's at, than, than we know. And I believe they've got the answers from a lot of the books from the Bible that they have suppressed and not put in the Bible. Um, um, so that's, that's, that's one thought that I have. But also, you know, the Vatican has one of the largest and uh, best telescopes in the world in Tucson, Arizona. I believe it's on Mount Graham. No, it's on Kitt Peak. 
right outside of Tucson. And uh, the code name for it is Lucifer. I forgot what Lucifer means, but it's an acronym for uh, for something. But who who out there also wouldn't think, I might be the only one in this panel tonight, that the reason that the government doesn't want us to know or the churches don't want us to know who God is is because it's some guy sitting on a throne at, at, at Zeta Reticulon where we are just a big science project to um, to the aliens, that they're the ones who started life here. Uh, you know, Cro-Magnon didn't, didn't work out, so they played around with the genes and it came up. And we are the latest science project for the uh for the um the aliens. Uh, Mike, able to take, take that information. Mike, there's a belief in in some uh, circles of religion that uh man has only been around for three thousand years. Uh now that would be maybe looked at as uh, as current man uh, in that aspect of it, uh, so uh, you know what uh, Jim is saying there. Would would you uh, would you agree with that? Would you think that that's a possibility? I I, I, I respect what he's saying, but no, I I, I have to disagree. I mean, uh, isn't everything God's will to those that believe? If if, if that's what yeah. you believe, I mean, yes. And what you're saying is God right. planned the conspiracy theory as well. Very well could be. I mean, it's just, it's so, another, it's, it's, just, it's another theory out there. Who knows what's right? Right, right. And I, and, and I think when we get off on this, and I, and I know if you do the research long enough, because I've done it with the spirits and the ghosts and stuff, that you're going to hear these different theories. That once again, in today's world, you know, in the '60s, they said a lot. When I was growing up, and look back at, at some of the man, everybody talked about the man. That there's this hidden powerful group of people that sit, in, you know, probably in the the penthouse of a, a very famous, historic, expensive hotel, and make all these decisions for mankind. And I think for a long time we thought that this was true, and this is not true. I don't believe this to be true in 2014. I believe people like Mark Cuban, the owner of the Mavericks, some of the wealthy people uh, that have come uh, to be very rich and very famous in the last 10 or 15 years due to the dot-com era and, and different things like that, would be a whistleblower, that they have the power, the influence, the knowledge, and the money these days to know about them, that they're not sucked into these secret groups and say, hey, we love you, Mark. you got billions of dollars now, but you cannot tell on us. We might invite you to sit at the table and you can make a few decisions, maybe about what goes on in the United States. We're going to have some of the top religious people there, and we make all these decisions for mankind based on what we think we know is best, and we shut everybody else up. I just Mike, uh, and, and uh, gentlemen, I need to interrupt for just a second. I've, I've got an amazing... Uh, opportunity and privilege here for all of us to speak to uh, uh, an amazing lady. Again, she was the organizer for the event that uh, Andrea Perrin and myself and also Mr. Heater attended uh, in Chicago, uh, the uh, Starworks Symposium, uh, just a few months back. Paula Harris joining us uh, on the show, and I'm so excited. Paula, thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate it very much. Anytime, George, anytime. Listen, you know, uh, Mr. Jim Heater is here, our Australian correspondent, uh, Mr. Ashley Hall, uh, Mr. Michael Bowler, my uh, host, uh, my partner with myself. And, uh, you know, we decided to go a different direction. Normally on Mondays, I know on Tuesday you've been on with uh, Andrea and myself on a World Awakening um, talking about the event. But uh, this is something that uh, we normally don't do on a Mondays. It's always about the spirit contact. But this is a... We're at a crossroads right now, I think, in in the world, and there and people are asking more questions. I don't know; if it's because of the, uh, the 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 worldwide net, the internet, the mass media, uh, the increasing, as it seems, increasing uh, uh, spotting of UFOs that are out there. The uh, the conferences that are going on that are almost parallel right now to spirit phenomena events that we happen to have here in the United States and, and worldwide. I know there was one huge one in Australia just recently uh, that Ashley attended. But uh, for yourself, give everybody first uh, who, who don't know you or the UFO community your involvement with um, this field. And um, just a, a quick bio for everybody so to, before we get up to speed. 
Well, basically, I'm an investigative journalist, which means I'm more like Barbara Walters. I ask the questions. I don't come, you know, with, with already preconceived uh, ideas where I'm trying to fit everybody into the box. I, since I'm international, I was born in Europe, in Italy, in Rome, and I was working out of there until 2007, and was in many countries in Europe. I have an international perspective on what's going on, and my my expertise really comes from my greatest teachers. And they, I worked with Dr. J. Allen Hynek for six years, and from 1980 to 86. And you know, he's the godfather of ufology. And my greatest, biggest story was. Um, Colonel Philip Corso that I brought to Europe and spent a great deal of time. He wrote the dip book the day after Roswell. And, and if you look on my Facebook, I just put Monsignor Balducci, God bless him, because these people have all passed on. And I spent a lot of time lecturing with him in Europe uh, about, uh, you know, it, the Vatican's view, or they, they allowed him to speak about, uh, you know, the extraterrestrials being like people, like, uh, you know, our brothers and sisters. So the background is that, and and since I wasn't, I'm sorry I haven't been following your show, I don't know what kinds of discussions you've been having. A good portion of it uh, so far has just been getting the opinions on so many of the different uh, myths, legends, and uh, half-truths about uh, those things that people out there have already experienced from a, a social standpoint, such as crop circles, uh, the debate of whether or not there's already alien life in existence here on Earth in humanoid form uh, that are passing as humans. And uh, again, what we're talking about now also is the conspiracy theory. And this is one I think that it's a perfect time for you to jump in on this discussion is regards to why, and, and this is Mike uh, Bowler, you know, the the host with me on the show that really asked this is, you know, why is it not being released to the public? If in truth there has been already contact, alien contact, whether it was the take me to your leader syndrome or they're going to the uh, religious authorities or they're as much involved, such as the Vatican, that uh, once the governments have been notified, that was the next direction. And then those powers that be, those those powerful, powerful people in society making those decisions. Do we release this to the public? And obviously the answer to this point is no, because our species is not prepared for it. In, in a lot of the different conferences that you've been to, uh, has this been a consistent debate? I know that a lot of what we talk about uh, is disclosure and as far as both parts of the community are concerned, but a lot of it in ufology, disclosure, disclosure, when is the government going to reveal what they know? Is it too much of sensitive material. And just before you call, the reason it was brought up, too, is because one of the first questions I think that society would ask in general would be, is there a God, would be the question to these aliens. So as a species, are we prepared? Is that a logical first-step reason as to why any uh, powerful government or authorities would withhold that information from society? My God, holy moly, there's about five questions in there in five different areas you're covering. Can I give you uh, some advice? So really, the book that has just come out that answers all of this is Timothy, Timothy Good's book, Earth, an Alien Enterprise. It is a masterpiece. It answers all these questions. And I consider the British researcher Timothy Good the best in the world probably after Wendell Stevens, God bless him, uh, who, who passed on. But the, answer is, the answers are simple. First of all, the early contacts, the 50s and 60s, and he starts with a, uh, a contact in 1932 in Montana, were people. They were people that came here, people that, that interacted with other people. And then he's got a whole chapter on the people, the alien people, <clears throat> that, uh, try to uh, talk to government um, authorities like Eisenhower, uh, who was very involved. I think that Kennedy knew. Uh, all those, what the problem was initially was the big concern over our nuclear capacities because whatever we were blowing up would also affect them in their in their uh, realm. And, and it was like the children discovered the matches. And if you listen to everybody's, testimony, whether it's the Adamski tapes, and people should go back to the 50s and 60s because the real truth is there. 
is that they were very concerned about our progression. We could have gone into a space-aged uh, a travel uh, economy instead of a war economy, that that crossroads was in the 1950s and 60s when everybody was scared to death that we were going to be destroyed by uh, by Russia with a nuclear bomb, and Russia was was afraid also. Uh, the, that was, if you study the geopolitical thing around this, you know that that's what was happening. As far as why it's being kept secret, it's obvious. It's obvious that whenever you have crashes, and we had them around Trinity site, uh, around where the Enola Gay was in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, where the 509th Bomb Squadron was, uh, you're not going to throw that craft in the garbage. You're not going to throw it in the trash. So we've had several crashes where we have taken the equipment and back-engineered it in the initial phase that went to Wright Patterson in the later phase, uh, and I do believe Bob Lazar's story, he wasn't making it up, I've talked to Bob Lazar, uh, it's gone to Area 51, and now Area 51 has gone somewhere else. The thing is that you're not going to release a technology that doesn't use oil or gas to a world that's based on not only wars dealing with oil, but uh, our, our, if, our fixation that that's the only t kind of propulsion system there is. And you are going to, uh, however, back engineer that. You are going to hold it in the back burner for whenever we're ready to release that. And that is real. It's got nothing to do with panic. 85% of the people believe there are UFOs. In Denver, we passed an initiative, a ballot where uh, we wanted to have some kind of agency research this uh, in, uh, four years ago, and the ballot, uh, pa uh, it didn't pass, but it, it was 46%. If we had gone into 50%, we could have been able to pass that ballot. People believe the problem is that it is very dangerous to go into a situation with an advanced technology, and we're the country that is the most closed about it, because being an international researcher, every other country has opened up its files. Italy even has a, in the Air Force part, has a UFO sighting part in the Air Force part. South America is talking about this. It's real. Their contacts, they, they talk about it. Go on my website. The contactees are meeting human-type aliens. The problem is, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the church, because the church has released statements saying there are brothers and sisters, that God, of course, would create more than just one species. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's about the technology, and I can only say that having known Colonel Philip Corso uh, very well. I mean, I spent vacations with him, and he told me that at the research and development desk at the Pentagon, he had the Roswell artifacts, and they had farmed them out into industry. Now, you've got the industry that's got a monetary economic hold on ufology, on the technology. And we're talking about big companies. So, and that's what the black budgets and the, and the, and the deep black programs are. I think that I, I would suggest that if people want to be educated, they get um, Timothy Good's book and they, and they download the movie Sirius which was done by Dr. Stephen Greer. Everything is in there, everything, everything you need to know. And it's fact. It's not uh, opinion or hypothetical or guessing. It's all fact. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think I gave you some information. Paul and Mike Bowler here now. Fascinating stuff. <clears throat> Very good stuff. George, I think, is getting some coffee real quick. He said, has his mic muted. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you for just a second because that's what I do on Mondays. Um, if this information was made public and if what you're saying is true, and I'm not saying it's not, but the government took a different stance and said, no, we owe it to the public. Uh, they vote us into office to be honest with them and protect our interest. Uh, we need to go public with what we have discovered here, uh, that aliens have visited us and we do have some of their technology that could advance our technology way beyond uh, what may take 50 years. Uh, you know, just as Jim said uh, about the cell phones, which I, I'd never heard that theory that cell phones came from alien technology. Um, I mean, paint the worst case scenario that you, you you were saying would happen if this was out. What is the worst case scenario here? 
I think in 2014 personally, uh, and I joked and said that, you know, maybe if the government came on, people would panic, but maybe if you had the Kardashians introduce on live television their alien friends and proved it, I think people might be okay with this. So what is the worst-case scenario here? You too, Sonny. Speaking of the Kardashians, did you see the episode where Travis Walton was in the Kardashian bus and all that Bruce Jenner did was just bash him, tell everybody he was crazy? No, I, I, mean, I don't watch him. I, I, you I, know, I, that, it, Travis, I, I couldn't believe that Travis, in a way, you know, did that, but because he's real, and ever, the Travis Walton story is real. It really happened, and so forth. And, uh, and the Kardashian girls had him in in their RUV, and they went to Area 15. This is this is America for you. Let's let's play this Disneyland game of, from re- real stuff. I mean, the, the the Travis Walton story is real stuff, and uh, I I really don't. You know, I'm I'm wondering which government you're talking about that wants to to release things to the people for the their own. Government. I'm wondering yeah. which one you're talking about. It's it, there's no. It, 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 there's no value to anybody in in the government to do that. Why would they do that? I mean, political it, 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 yeah, they they would there'd be no value. But you got to look at another thing: the beings, and they're still around, went directly to the people. At the end of the well, they, they they let it go. Uh, I mean, they, they left a, a procedure which would have been, a, you know, a diplomatic procedure. They let it go, so they went directly. To the people, they're contacting people directly. They're uh, appearing, or they people are being. Dr. John Mack, who was a Harvard University professor just before he died, told me people were being directly downloaded, which meant you, you're if you want to know, you go and you meditate and you get your answers. Uh, that you can, with the intent, you can you can communicate with the ETs, uh, and you don't need to be abducted. You know, so the thing is, I think that whoever's out there went directly to the people. But you know something? Half the world doesn't care. They've got so much on their plate that I can do a presentation for two hours with real information, all factual, and people would go home and think it was entertainment. I really think that half the world, maybe your listeners do, but for the most part, the average person really doesn't care. Could you give me, very quickly, the best piece of factual information you have to convince me as a skeptic that everything that you're discussing with me is factual? No, I'm not going to do that. That, that is, that is, that is, I'm a teacher. I've got a master's in education. It's like a student asking me, to, to uh, why would I teach history? Uh, or something you're like that. You're saying everything. Now, 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 I'm not trying to create an argument or just. No, argument. but you're, I mean, if you want to know, if you're and saying I everything read, is factual, but you can't give me any facts. No, no, I never said everything is factual. If you read Timothy Good's book, and I'm hoping some people still read, I'm really hoping people read. Timothy Good is an excellent, excellent researcher. He goes, you know why he's excellent, and and I do the same thing. We're field researchers. We go on location. We speak to the people. We look at their faces. We know if they're lying. Uh, in my case, since I've been doing it for 30 years, I can tie it to other things. All of my four books are interviews with military and astronauts. Yeah, a factual? Okay, I'm friends with uh, Edgar Mitchell, sixth man that walked on the moon. I've talked to him at length. We're very good friends. He wants the Roswell files open. He knows that the astronauts have to have contact. He wants it done in his old age. That's factual. I, I'm not saying that it's not factual that they're saying. I'm just saying is, is that I wish we had a little bit more concrete factual evidence versus somebody's opinion and somebody's faith in the belief of somebody being honest in what they're me saying. Too, me which too. Is I'm, on the same, I'm on the same page as you are. Me too. Me too. You and I are on the same page because all that there's out there is opinion. So you can go on internet and it's all opinion. You go everywhere and it's all opinion, and nobody's done the homework. So right, yeah, right. You're, and, and you, you I am with you 100. percent Right. As I nobody's started this the, show, I, I as a skeptic right. said that I would have to uh, be insanely uh, ridiculous to say that with what is out there, the vast galaxy that we live in, uh, our universe, if there's not some other form of intelligence out there, that uh, uh, I would be uh, sadly 
uh, misspoken to say that there's not a great possibility there is. And, Jim, before we've got some chat questions I know George wants to get to, I wanted you to jump in on this, too, on what I had asked, what you think the worst-case scenario might be if you had a reply to that, too, before we move on. Yeah, this is for Jim. Jim Heater, go ahead, Jim Heater. Jim Heater. Okay, Jim, okay. Would, okay. You, you mind, would you mind repeating the question one more time? You are very well, well I basically what I'm saying is, is that in, in, in our discussion tonight, that what's been brought up so heavily is the theory that the government, and, and, and for lack of better terms, the religious uh, po- political government that, that, that governs the churches, uh, knows a lot more than what they're saying, but yet they don't come public with this. Um, because we can't handle it, because we're not ready for it, or there's nothing to gain from it. And my thought was uh, that if they're keeping us or saving us from something, if they chose not to, worst-case scenario, uh, if there's theories about why they're doing it, then what are the theories of what would happen if they didn't do it? And they made all this public, and this was all true and factual, that we had been visited and we did have technology that they didn't understand or could move us forward on our church. What's the worst-case scenario in 2014 that you go public with us? Well, I, I do believe that that the human race as a whole is not ready to know what is actually going on out there. Uh, again, this is just my opinion. In the 50s, late 40s, early 50s, I think that it would have been easier for the human race to accept this. But everything that, that the a lot of the stuff with the people who don't really do any research on this, the only thing they know about aliens is what they see in the movies. And, of course, it's, it's Independence Day all over again where they're going to come down and attack us. So I, I, I think that a lot of them just figure that that's what's going to happen, that they're not going to be nice and come down, and like George said earlier, you know, take me to your leader. Uh, then we've got to figure out who that is. And... Um, I, I, I just I really don't think that it would be that they're ready for it, and I I can't fathom or I have no idea what they would uh, what they do. I don't think they'd be rioting in the streets, but I do think there would be an upsurge in religion. Uh, I think there'd be a lot. I think all the churches would be full on uh, on Sundays, Saturday night. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I understand, and, and and that makes sense now that uh, basically the doomsday type prep that uh, worst-case scenario would be the one that a lot of people would look at, uh, that the end is coming, that that's the only reason they possibly could be here would be take over uh, and possibly uh, exterminate the human race. Um, and, and I guess protecting uh, the mass chaos, uh, the globe from mass uh, confusion chaos on situations like that uh, until they yeah, get the word out, not thinking they could. So, uh, George, I know uh, anybody that uh, had a question tonight, you could put it in chat. Uh, 646-929-2384 if you want to join the conversation with George. We have some chat questions, do we? Uh, no, there's actually this question is mine for uh, for Paul and then Jim to follow up also on this. And yeah, I, I 100% agree. I mean, look, I mean, people go into mass suicide when, you know, in sync breaks up. You know, Y2K, anything that goes on that, that looks like it's going to be the end of the world, people take their lives, uh, or there's a cult leader who gets their followers to take their lives. So, yeah, again, I agree that uh, from from an aspect of globally as a species, uh, and I think Jim makes it a very, very credible point, for the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, our entire society from the aspect of mainstream media has been fear-based. Everything is fear, 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 fear. Take this medicine because you probably have this affliction. Watch your children. Watch this. Watch that. It's it's all fear-based. So we have become a, a cowardice society in a sense that we're afraid of uh, of mortality, and it's, it's a frightening thing. Uh, Paula, I, I'm going to preface my question with another question first, which is, and, and if you can answer it simply with a yes or no, if it's possible, then I'll, I'll continue on for it. But uh, I, I guess this is the important part of this entire field. Do you think that the government should disclose, or do you think that the powers that be that have had alien contact should disclose that information, yes or no? God, I don't know how to answer that. I really don't. Um, well, let me go I, like this. What's the point and purpose? I don't what is, think we need it. What is the point and purpose of the conferences that you attend and organize? 
just the, that there's enough information out there and there's enough uh, testimony out there that this is a reality and then that we need to prepare, put something in place like the psychological implications, the social implications, and all the implications of contact. So the purpose of the conference is, is look, it's real. What do you want to do about it? I mean, never mind the government. They've got their own agenda. But if it's real, what do you want to do about it? What what do you want to put in place? What kind of structure? Do you want the United Nations to handle it? It's not an American thing. Do you want to to get a committee to handle this? Do you want to educate the public? What, how do, what do we want to do? And so since I'm a teacher, and that, I, I didn't mean to, to say it the way I said it, but I'm a teacher, uh, I have to look at how you – you know, very gently, gently in baby steps deal with the general public with something this big and look at the sociological implications. So that's what exopolitics is, and that's what I'm very much involved in. I think it's an important part of it when it comes to social media once again. As you said, that Hollywood portrays uh, most of the aliens as invaders. And is that, a uh, again, a, a psychological ploy uh, that the government involves with Hollywood. We always th- thought that they go hand in hand in one aspect or another, uh, that they, there are controlling factors to that, that they decided let's do that this way. People are too afraid to ask questions. If they're afraid that these aliens are going to be dangerous, they don't want that interaction. Therefore, they're going to see an alien, they're going to see a ship, and they're going to run the other way in fear of abduction or experiments, things of that nature. Uh, the reason I brought that up, and again, I want you to respond to this, and then uh, Mr. Jim Heater, if you could follow up too. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks back, Paula, on uh, Tuesday night with uh, Andrea and myself on A World Awakening, uh, we had a chance to speak to uh, Lee Spiegel. And I told him that I was going to resolve all the problems in the ufology community in one night. <laughs> and after he stopped laughing, I, I gave him this explanation. I want your thoughts on it. What we do in the spirit phenomena part of the of the paranormal umbrella is go out to historically haunted locations, uh, places that uh, have a reputation for uh, consistent activity, and try to document uh, and use new equipment and new and use new procedures to try to establish better contact. Now, there's a multitude of conferences that go on in the UFO uh, community, but what I would venture to say would be the the ultimate end all be all of the game would be uh, that if there were a group, let's just call them eight, eight of the top minds in the community who would travel to Venezuela, who would travel to Costa Rica, South America, to Europe, uh, here in the United States, to the hottest spot where the abductions and the sightings have been most consistent and spend five days in the field with videographers, with photographers, some of them a foot away, a hundred feet away, a thousand feet away, a mile away, where they are viewing and filming everything that you all are doing, whether you're in a circle with tinfoil on your heads or anything that you would possibly be doing for contact in hopes that one or all of you would be abducted because this is not like uh, an abduction that would happen to uh, just a civilian out there where they wouldn't be prepared. You would be expecting this. And in expecting this, the possibility of being able to be a player in this game. And what I mean by that is no matter what government uh, uh, in, uh, uh, society, the, what, no matter what religious sect, wh- whoever has power and control uh, over divulging or, or, or giving out this information in disclosure form, the aliens still have to agree. And they're probably the much more powerful of the two. They could land, again, on the White House lawn. They could land at Central Park. They could do whatever they want to do, but they choose not to, working in conjunction with the powers that be here on Earth. So if you're in a situation, instead of going to these conferences and sharing uh, who's written the best books and who's got the best pictures and who's doing the most blog talk and who's doing the most interviews, that there was an active part of the community who was going out there, and again, the great minds that, that are in this field are going out to these extremely active UFO locations in hopes of alien contact to become part of that. Even if you were abducted, now you could talk to them one-on-one and say, this is what we need to do, this is how we should be doing it, rather than being the outside viewer looking into the window 
of that community or that relationship between aliens and government, would it not be better as part of the UFO community to try to make that established contact and instead of just talking about it at the conferences, but actually be investigators? Okay, the first of all, none of my conferences do any of the things you talked about. I had the former defense minister of Canada at my conference in 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 uh in um Seabrig, Florida and uh people then they weren't talking about books there and and you know in Chicago we talked about air safety. So all, only the people, the journalists and the people involved with air safety, which I think is an issue with UFOs, it's not just contact. But let me just tell you that the one that I'm planning in in Laughlin, Nevada, November 14th, 15th, and 16th, where Andrea will be present, we're going to have for the first time at Acabo Gonzalez, who is one of the contactees in South America, and most of the really good contact is in South America now. Uh, He's going to be in the United States for the first time, and he's going to speak. Sixto Paz did the very thing you talked about. He took journalists with him. And he took uh, took uh, videographers with him, and they saw him go inside the ship, and some of the journalists did. But, you know, in America, we don't do anything but the old-fashioned ufology, so people don't know anything about Sixto Paz or Ricardo Gonzalez or Luis Fernando uh, Mostacio, whom I interviewed. They're on my website because I had to go there. I had to go to South America that does things completely differently from us, that is not commercial, that is not Disneyland, that is not entertainment, for how they dealt with real contact. And these people have incredible photos, incredible movies. In the case of Sixto Paz, if people research him, he brought journalists, videographers. It's a, it's a reality. It's, but down there it's normal. I mean, they're looking at it as nothing different. The only issue I take, George, is that it's not abduction. Abduction means being taken against your will and everything. I mean, we do that, and we we murder people and throw their bodies in the dumpster here on Earth. Uh, The the beings, the beings, I think it's better to call it contact. And you can go there in, in, in a circle. It's contact or whatever. They put you back in bed, for God's sake. You know, I mean, when does somebody abduct a kid and put him back in bed? Uh, here, uh, human beings don't even do that. But anyway, the, the I believe that the paranormal, or what you call the paranormal, uh, when you do your investigations and when Jim does them, are just in the same area as UFO research. They're not separate. It's all dimensional phenomenon. It's dimensional it's hard to explain it's real it's all part of one if you look at it it's not separate and to answer your question it's being done Louis Mustachio is bringing a group of people into the salt desert uh, in uh, August to do just that but it's down in South America I I'm probably going to speak for Mike Bowler first on this one here and say if it is out there, where can we find this video of this gentleman stepping onto the uh, alien craft? The first thing you have to do is study Six So Paz, everything about him, and I interviewed him. Uh, so I oh, have no, to no, interview him. Just yeah. straight up, where, where can we find it? Him. You need to ask him. You need to ask. Uh, Six So Paz was uh, denied entry into the United States at the border. So he's had serious problems trying to get here to disclose. But so he, can you, he just on YouTube? YouTube is international. Can he create a website in his home country uh, and put a video on his home? Has, yeah, but I mean that's ask, that's asking for you, you're going to get all the skeptics saying it's not real anyway. Isn't it better to talk to Sixto Paz and ask him uh, if, they, if the journalists signed non-disclosure agreements? What happened? and so forth, but I know for a fact that that's part of Sixto Paz's contact with bringing journalists and video. He has video, but he lives in Peru. And and another problem is he doesn't speak English. That's that's a major... All the interviews I did was on Skype with an interpreter, so it means I went to a lot of trouble. Uh, So, you know, if you want to... I'll give you all the contact information. If you want to contact him... And you've got to get an interpreter, unfortunately. 
uh, you he'll probably cooperate with that because he's tried to come to the United States and been denied entry. It, and, and this is probably where I'm going to get myself in trouble and probably where Andrea, who's listening in in the chat, is going to cringe because she's knowing where I'm going with this. But uh, no, uh, if, in answer to my your, your statement or suggestion on that, I don't want to talk to him. And here's the only reason why is because then in our paranormal community, sometimes we get guests who come on the show and they talk about the time that they were scratched, the time that they were pushed, the time they saw a full body apparition, the time that something floated across the floor, the time that something disappeared. And we categorize that all together as ghost stories. Because, again, from a pragmatic standpoint in this field, we need to collect the evidence. And in this particular case, talking to him just turns into another ghost story because he could tell me about the complete journey while he was on board that ship. Go there. Go there. Go there. If I had money, I would be there in two minutes because they've invited me down there. The problem is that this kind of field research, and you know this, you know this, Andrea knows this, everything, is not supported. In other words, we don't have the money to go and to do the research. It's done from far away. In my case, I do it face-to-face, so I look at them. But, you know, people should do this kind of, you should take a tour. Take a tour and go down there. And I'm sure that, in I know in Jim's investigations, he sees them face-to-face. And I think in some of your investigations, you guys go there. It's called field research. And, and Paul, you're right. You just need to get some calls there. Um, I think where I, 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 I kind of want to go, and, and Jim, let's start with you on this, is, is that one of the problems with not only the ghost and spirit community along with the UFOs, because we're both paranormal, uh, and even the Bigfoot, and we've had some of those uh, researchers on here, it's the proof's in the pudding. And I'm not saying that what you guys are doing, I'm not trying to debate you and say that you're making this up as we go, because I don't think you are. I believe in what you're saying, and, and I'm fascinated with this field, too. I wouldn't do these shows. But if I went fishing every weekend and told you guys on the shows on Monday and my girlfriend and everybody about the 20- and 30-pound fish that I was catching, but I never brought them home, I never had a picture of them. The phone always fell in the lake and it ruined the picture. The fish got away, it did this and it did that. You're still going to believe me because you like me and you think I'm an honest person, but you'd like for once to see a picture of the fish. And I think that's where we're at, and I think the problem is is that we have a lot of tangible evidence out there that we love talking about and going over, but when we act as though it's credible as a community, the people that are not involved in the community do not respect the community as a whole. And I think what we need to do is kind of look at things for what they exactly are and say, this is very interesting. This is very interesting. We don't know that it's evidence. We don't know that it's factual. Uh, it needs more research, but we can certainly put it in the pile that we have not confirmed or made this factual yet and move along with the small things. Just because we don't have a lot of facts doesn't mean that it's not out there. It may be there. It's a very slow process. As George and I have said in the ghost and spirit realm, we're only pioneers, or at least I think a lot of people are, that 100 years from now, who knows where this research will be. And, and, and Jim, your thoughts on that? I uh, I think there's so much disinformation out here. I mean, anybody can try to make a video and of, of a of a uh, spaceship crossing their backyard or uh, going past a, a, a large city. That that stuff definitely doesn't help um, the research, the UFO research. It's the same thing in the spirits or in the uh, the uh, ghost hunting world people coming up with EVPs that aren't a real voice or uh, uh, using uh, an iPhone app to insert a ghost into a picture. This this uh, this is going to be around for a long time until, until like you said, someone, I guess George said, a, uh, a ship lands in the uh, White House lawn. But, but going back just a little bit, I honestly do think that there is in our government a a group of people that are almost constantly in contact with whatever life form this is, this is whether it's from um, uh, Zeta Reticula or whether they're from the 800 feet down, the reptilians. Somehow we are we are involved with these people, and we do have rules that we do have to follow. On, here on Earth, um, I mean, 
there's uh, their stories. Now, again, they're stories, but there are a lot of witnesses to these stories and a lot of facts back it up where President Eisenhower met twice with, uh, with alien beings, and one of them was to agree on another treaty. So, you know, you know this, this is all, all conjecture and all theory, but I, I'm sorry, I got off track. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. You're right there. Paula, um, in today's political environment, I know you kept getting away from the government a while ago, but that's what we started with, as you said, them along with the churches know this. With all the uh, political, um, you know, somebody uh, finds out uh, somebody has had an affair on their wife or husband who is uh, a political person. Somebody in the church has been accused of uh, some type of a sex scandal or, or, or embezzling or, or, or something of that nature that they say, that's fine, if you use this against me for political gain, I will go public with what I know about the aliens. Why is this not happening in 2014? I don't have any idea how to answer that. Uh, why don't they do it? I don't know why they uh, – because I don't think anybody – I think that the disclosure – in the government, first of all, whoever knows doesn't have access. You know, the only thing I can say for people that really want to know is to study this thing. And the movie Sirius talks about who knows, how it was impossible for, for people like Dr. Greer to get uh, government officials to get access to the deep back black projects because even the president doesn't have access, that this is so compartmentalized that all of this is so compiled that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So I don't think anybody in the government knows anything about this. Uh, you know, that what I attended, which was amazing, was the citizen hearing in Washington, D.C., April of last year. And it was a mock, uh, a mock hearing with six government uh, congressmen, one senator, and they had 39 witnesses from all over the world, and they were all military. They were generals from South America. They were uh, people from England. They were people from China talking about the UFO phenomenon. And uh, what I saw in the faces of the congressman and, and Senator Gravel was that they turned white. They were very upset. They, they, you know, they didn't know what to do. I saw one woman, uh, co uh, the Congressman Fitzpatrick, just shaking because she didn't realize it was real. It's not portrayed as real. I think they thought they were going to be talking about sightings, and then when these generals come on board and all these people from all over the world uh, are coming on board talking about this, that's as close as disclosure as you can get. But that was... It didn't go very far. We live streamed that. Uh, it, you know, it, it, we live streamed it. I don't think half the general public really cared. Wow, that's interesting. Stuff turned white. Uh, obviously, Obama's been kept in secret on this. Well, I think they, they probably he doesn't have a need to know. I mean, this need to know stuff. He didn't have a need to know, so they didn't tell him. I think there is a group. Um, uh, from because all my books are military, all my books are military, uh, and people that have worked in you know black projects and so forth. I think I think what happens is that that uh, they figure that these people don't need to know, so they keep this secret. And there's a micromanaging group. I think they're con probably connected with the Illuminati group because the, that group is is monetary. It's they want to keep the economy going. You're not going to release that we have, uh, you know, exotic technologies to the world because we might save our planet if we use them. Uh, but anyway, the thing is that I think there's a micromanaging group, and I think it has nothing to do with the government. I think it's a group of paramilitary with uh, industrial people, and I think that's who manages this secret. I don't think the well, government know anything. What I wonder about, too, Paula, and uh, I, I, uh, we've got to go into um, uh, the two callers coming up here in just a second, but um, if that were not the direction to go as far as a third, uh, third kind of close encounter, uh, that the alternative to it, and something we've talked about here in the, the spirit phenomena field, is the, uh, the monitoring, the governmental monitoring of um, all, all different forms of communication, whether it's the Internet, whether it's our cell phones, that uh, if in a circumstance that uh, there is alien contact, in a circumstance that there's Bigfoot contact, 
or enormous breakthroughs in uh, spirit uh, connections and communication uh, that, that they would swoop in immediately because, again, knowing the implications of what's involved, where in a particular case, should it be a situation where Paula Harris is um, going out to a location and in the midst of all of this, a true contact has occurred, you simply tweet or text message or phone call or blog or write about the fact that you've had this encounter where more than likely in a circumstance like this you will become uh, integrated into the government projects or the powers that be, as you said, uh, whether it be military or whether it be um, uh, businesses, you will be integrated into that group and, and assist them in the research from that point forth. You will be off the grid. You will be no longer allowed to divulge any information of what you've experienced, but you would still be doing the work, but behind the curtain, if you will, at that point in time. And that's something that I've also believed would be uh, an end-all, be-all in any form of the communication out there, because simply divulging it out there to society, one of two things will be happening. It will be disbelief or it will be, uh, unfortunately, feared and, and not looked at uh, from a progressive standpoint. But, um, Paula, uh, if you could, before we go any further, give everybody all of your contact information, your website, uh, and uh, some of the upcoming events, including the one in Nevada, once again, please. Yeah, but let me say first, well, you're absolutely right. It happened to Howard Menger that way. When he had contact at Highbridge, New Jersey, he started working for government projects that was here in Colorado Springs because he knew about the propulsion system. But you have to read the book from outer space to you to find that out. I really, I know I'm an English teacher, but people have to start reading. They have to read first-hand sources. And uh, my contact information is just my name, and I'm Italian. It's P-A-O-L-A Harris uh, at ApollaHarris.com, one. And then StarWorks is the conference I'm putting together on consciousness, and a UFO. So I'm going in a completely different direction than the regular UFO conferences. I mean, this is all new blood and all new thinking and, and mixing together the dimensional phenomena. And that's the one in Laughlin, Nevada, November 14th, 15th, and 16th under the company StarWorksUSA.com. And people that want to see Andrea and, and a lot of the people that have some of these answers because it's not just you have, uh, you know, nuts and bolts people that are going to get the answers. It's going to be people that are interested in the whole dimensional 360 can come to that conference in Laughlin. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd be one of the ones to be joining on board with that also, without question. If they wanted to uh, bring me into the fold, I'd be happy as hell to do that. As far as reading the books, I'm waiting for the movie to come out. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Andrea would say right away, Andrea would say, they were, it already did, George. It's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's true. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that movie is real. Yeah, I, I talked to the guy that was the consultant. That was Alan Hynek's film um, with Spielberg. And Spielberg was on his board of directors, okay, when I was working for Hynek. So Spielberg's an insider. Oh, God bless. Yeah, and uh, I, I have a feeling he's not done with uh, expressing it either. Uh, Paula, you're more than welcome to stay with us. Uh, I've got some guests uh, calling in. We've got some topics to discuss, but uh, feel free to stay if we uh, lose you during that or you have to go. Uh, I can't thank you enough for such an impromptu visit with us. Uh, it's been extremely educational, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you in that Nevada time frame. I'll be going along with Andrea. Well, I love you guys. I do anything for you, so I hope that you know that it was. I give you some kind of information. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. We'll have to have you back again, honey. Okay. Take care. Thank you, darling. Um, Mike, before we uh, – I got Bridget on hold here, and I want to talk about the event that uh, Bridget and uh, Jim had uh, uh, visited uh, this weekend, Fort Mifflin, and, and some of their adventures there. Uh, before we do, I want to bring in a very special individual. He's been uh, somewhat of a silent partner with the Dead Air Paranormal family. He's worked uh, in conjunction with uh, Wednesday Night's Paranormal. And uh, he's about to uh, go on an endeavor with you, starting, uh, as a matter of fact, this coming Friday. Uh, and we're talking about um, uh, Mr. William Peters, Mr. Wild Bill joining us. Wild Bill, thank you for joining us tonight, my friend. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Absolutely wonderful. 
Now, Mike, uh, you guys can work in partnership on this and ch- kind of give everybody what's going to be going on with the Paranormal Channel Network, uh, part of our Dead Air family, debuting this coming Friday. How often are we going to be hearing from you guys on this and what it's basically about? Well, we had uh, talked and we realized that I was way underutilizing my talents. One, being one of the better-looking men in the paranormal field, so as Wild Bill suggested, we uh, appointed me as anchorman of the newfound <laughs> PCN Paranormal Channel News. <laughs> it's going to air this Friday, premiere this Friday, June 27th, uh, 2014, at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, 6 Pacific, right here on Dead Air, and simulcast through YouTube through the Paranormal Channel, which it'll be a little bit of a delay, but we'll have that up there. And what we're going to do, George, is uh, Tracy Todd's also going to be joining us, produced by Pamela Croker. Um, we want to do more of a news show. That We love these long uh, discussions like we're having tonight where we get into the uh, meat and potatoes of, of what makes this uh, community go. But with what we're trying to do with the news is we want to bring different people from around the globe, not just the country, but from around the globe, uh, so let us know what's going on in the community, uh, some of the new findings, uh, whether it be crop circles like we discussed tonight, if something like that comes up. Uh, our lead reporter, Tracy Todd, will be reporting on that. Uh, William is going to be along with me. Uh, we're going to kind of do If you've ever watched Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel, uh, we will allow the reporters. We're not going to have guests. We'll have reporters. And if anybody's interested in reporting for PCN, please contact us, and we'll get that info out to you where they have about 7 to 10 to, to 12 minutes to, to basically uh, research and, and, and tell us what they've discovered. Uh, at a point in time, William and myself will uh, kind of be brief and, 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 and ask a few questions uh, that we think the general audience would want to know. Uh, we'll take a, big, a quick break, and uh, we're going to go on to the next report. Uh, if you've ever listened to Paranormal Kool-Aid, uh, William uh, Peters, as we call him, Wild Bill, uh, was instrumental in getting that off the ground with Chris Medina, which that still airs every Wednesday uh, right here on Dead Air, uh, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Uh, but if you listen to the music, the commercials, the drops that we've added in uh, to the show, which I think makes it a very special presentation, it's going to be a part. Uh, Williams worked very hard uh, in, in putting some of the things together that you'll have to tune in this Friday. Uh, Absolutely. Go ahead, we Okay. Well, I have to confess, this is going to be my first time on the air as a co-host. So I'm no longer a silent partner, but I am a stuttering partner. So some of my parts might take a little longer than usual, but that's okay. It is a paranormal show anyway, so there's nothing normal about my voice. (laughs) <laughs> and, and uh, I wouldn't in this <laughs> it, it, Bill in this particular field I tell you this it, it's not a speech impediment it's speech enhancement <laughs> well every time I have been abducted by the aliens I, I keep asking them if they could put in some type of a voice activation Shippers, something, <laughs> but they end up leaving me stranded in an open field in Colorado naked. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. What they're doing between the time that you are uh, first on the ship <laughs> naked, anybody's <laughs> guess. But again, it's going to be a great, uh, you know, a great direction to go. Anybody who wants to, uh, yeah. Uh, suggest Topics or, or want to come on uh, possibly as an anchor with uh, uh, this new debut show, and, and and it's again it's going to be the last Friday of each month. It's only going to be once a month, guys. So it's important to get the critical stories for the month uh, each month uh, to bring up topically. You could either go to uh, Mr. Bowler's page, Michael Bowler, on Facebook, or go to the Facebook uh, page for our show, Dead Air Paranormal Radio. And uh, put those suggestions in there, um, or your resumes, for that matter, if you'd like to come on board and join it. Uh, but uh, I, I'm really excited about this launch, guys. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I will be listening uh, diligently uh, this this coming Friday night for the debut. And uh, might even call in. Depends on um, you know what Mike's schedule is going to be for the entire show. But uh, I'm excited for you guys, and I wish 
you guys the best of luck. I know you're going to do a, a bang up job. And uh, well, Bill, you just need to come out of your shell with your sense of humor. That's all I got to say. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I will give it a college try. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, um, uh, you guys stay with us. Uh, well, Bill, stay with us as long as you can. I know you're on the road, but uh, I'd love okay. for you to stick around. Uh, but uh, we're going to bring this. Uh, uh, this wonderful uh, lady on with us as well uh, from the Gettysburg Ghost Girls. Let me start before I bring her on to uh, Jim Heater. Uh, did uh, Bridget bring any moonshine to Fort Mifflin? I actually didn't go. I didn't go to this. Bridget? <laughs> yes. Did, 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 you, did you bring? Well, I know you brought bug spray, but apparently that didn't work well there, did it? Um, no, all I can say is I, I really know um, what uh, mosquito a la rare tastes like. <laughs> God. Bridget McDermott Good, one of the Gettysburg Ghost Cows, joining us here tonight. So, yeah, you guys went to Fort Mifflin this weekend. Uh, Jim was there, yourself, uh, an incredible entourage. I know our dear Mr. Zaffis had joined you guys there as well, uh, and you did some investigating, but uh, it was... Um, uh, summer's here, isn't it? No, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. It was, it was really, it was a wonderful weekend. Um, we, you know, it was. Per, it, the weather was actually really nice. It wasn't too hot. Uh, we arrived up there Friday night around six o'clock. Uh, had a lovely dinner with Mr. Zaffis, and and he was talking quite fondly of Buttercup. And um, uh, we had a nice time with John Brightman, uh, Marcel and Jen. Uh, We all sat around, had dinner Friday, and then the event started at about 4 o'clock. And, uh, you know, we were were just going up um, to just kind of see how the events were worked, to get used to it. Uh, But we actually wound up participating. Uh, We were checking everybody in. Uh, putting bracelets on everybody, uh, you know, making jokes, having a good time. And then we actually led a group at the fort. And uh, like I said, it was it was great if you were in the buildings, but if you were standing in the middle of the grass, uh, you really got to taste mosquitoes. <laughs> but the fort is an absolutely beautiful location. Uh, you know, lots of buildings uh, were dying to actually get back out there and investigate it. It is absolutely huge. Uh, it just what an incredible, beautiful place, and and Lorraine who runs the fort, really great lady. Uh, Lisa and Dawn from Pups were there; they were terrific as well. I uh, had a lot of fun with John Brightman, um, and David Roundtree had also come up. He was helping out. Uh, it was just it was a free for all, and and uh, and we had a little cannon incident at the end of the night. <laughs> I heard about that, too, which I want you to elaborate on, too. But, uh, uh, Jim Heater, let's go with the cliche question. What's the scariest moment you had at Fort Mifflin? I was not there. I thought you were attending that. No, sir. Why the hell did I I think that you were there? I don't know. I don't know, because you're basically everywhere, my friend. I know (laughs) you're always going to all these different events. But have you... uh, yeah. I can make something up real quick. Hey, he, sure. he was there, George. He was selling moonshine. He was there. Mr. Heater. Uh, no, I wouldn't believe Jim to do that whatsoever. He's a consummate professional. I've gotten no. a chance to investigate with him, and, and he is uh, uh, very stoic in his, in his... Okay, yes, he probably did sell a moonshine, all right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, no, Bridget, please go ahead and uh, and tell the uh, canon story because we do have to have it on record so that uh, Mr. Zaffis will know from everyone else. <laughs> well, it was towards the end of the night and, and at the end of the Fort Mifflin events with Ideal, uh, they set off a cannon at the end. So uh, Zaffis knew well enough to stand back, and I knew well enough not to go into the fields where all the bugs were, so I stood back by the gift shop, and Nikki was over in the gift shop. And uh, I was standing there talking to John, and he was eating his pretzel. And he was like, yeah, I always stand back here. I hate it when they set off the cannon. And literally he said that, and the cannon went off for the first time, and he jumped about 50 feet in the air. <laughs> Almost lost his pretzel, but he didn't. 
and uh, and then shortly after that, he he did take off. So he he stayed for one or two blasts, and then uh, and then I hear John Brightman screaming, "Bridget, Bridget!" And the only thing I could think is, "Oh no, what did I do wrong?" So they called me up and they said it was my initiation into ideal that I had to shoot the cannon off. So I called Nikki. I said, let's go shoot this thing off. And Nikki and I got the pleasure of shooting the cannon off at 2 o'clock in the morning at Fort Mifflin. Oh, I'm sure the neighbors loved that as well. (laughs) Yes, they did. Well, it's terrific. While you're standing there, there's like planes literally... The, it's at the end of um, Philadelphia International Airport, so you're watching all the planes come in and land, and you're like, wow, I hope that doesn't fall out of the sky and, like, crash into the fort, you know? But it's it's a really cool sight to see, and, uh, you know, it, it it was funny watching watching John get, um, get a little bit riled up from the cannon. <laughs> well, he may have not lost his pretzel, but I'm sure he lost something else, like his bladder, but... Uh, <laughs> Probably hit him up on that in a future discussion too, Bridget. You've been with us probably uh, I know since about twenty about twenty five minutes now or so. You heard some of this discussion. I know you were very very vocal in the chat room. Uh, what were your thoughts on some of the things that we were bringing up? Uh, and again, it's it's hard pressed for for someone like Mike Bowler. It's hard pressed for someone like myself. Uh, and and I wouldn't exclude Ashley Hall or Jim Heater from this also. That we're always looking to. Uh, get away from the ghost stories and get, a, get get into the factual evidence, even if it means that once that divulgence is there, uh, once that disclosure is there, that uh, we will no longer be heard from. We'll be taking off of the uh, the grid or off the radar because we'll be integrated into the government. But uh, is there something that you would add that maybe hasn't been touched upon or that you would strongly agree or disagree with so far in the discussion we had tonight? Well, I'm t- I'm kind of sided to where you are, and I you can, and I and I tried to make it clear in the chat room that I that I wasn't being con you know trying not to be condescending um, to the discussion, but uh, I would say it's and I feel the same as ghosts. You, you just like you said, you can tell a story, but if you don't have meat or evidence to back that up, then it's still a story. And I came in on the end of it, so I don't know what the described situation was, but. All I was reading was that a spaceship landed uh, during one of the soccer games uh, down south in, uh, you know, South America. On a, during a game, is that what they is that what they were claiming? Uh, no, 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 whatsoever. That was just a uh, an eye grabber for the show tonight. <laughs> That's all that was. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, George. <laughs> um, I I just think when you you know, there's so many things in this world, just like when, when you're ghost hunting and, you know, a, a, a good ghost hunter always, always debunks. They always question their own evidence. You you always have to question. Um, and then when when you cannot disprove it and you feel strongly, that that's how I view evidence. If I feel strongly after really trying to disprove something that it is paranormal, then I say it may be paranormal. I, I never say 100% ever with proof positive something is paranormal. But, you know, I know a lot of these people have these UFO experiences, and from a large majority of the shows I have watched personally, um, even some of the MUFON ones, uh, uh, especially uh, the occurrences that took place around near the Poconos area, a lot of the people were seeing um, triangular-shaped craft with three lights and, and uh, you know, I mean, just, just knowing the stealth fighters that are out there, the designs of some of these craft, that I think, yes, a lot of people are seeing what they're seeing in the air, but I think a large percentage of the time it can be explained away. It, how do you know the government is not testing something top secret? You don't, and nor are they going to say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be testing some top secret spacecraft uh, over the Poconos this evening, so you may see it. They don't tell the public that, so people are with their cameras, oh, I think I see something, and uh, like I said, it's just like with seeing new ghosts, you know, it's it's... You know, unless you're, it's in your face, you walk inside and, like, see an alien, you don't know, is, it, is that government issued? Is it, you know, there can be so many other explanations. So I think before, you know, someone goes and claims that, oh, this is definitely a UFO, 
uh, how can you be sure when something's up in the sky a quarter mile away from you? You know, you cannot be. So, you know, it's possibly a UFO or possibly something else, you know. So I believe, uh, I know you believe in questioning things a lot, George. I, I believe you have to question a lot. And um, and like I said, even, even with the paranormal, you know, as far as uh, ghost hunting goes, you know, I'm not a I'm not a big believer in pictures. I'm not I'm not I'm not too happy with still photographs. There there can be a lot of errors in still photographs. Even sometimes on video, people mistake things for things. So I I think you you have to be very thorough in your investigation methods and also your uh, debunking debunking or dis, uh, disproving methods. Uh, Jim Heater, do you think that there will be a lot more in the future here of cross uh, research between ufology and spirit phenomena? Uh, there are studies and, uh, and claims also of certain historically haunted locations, such as Rolling Hills Asylum, where the proprietor Sharon Coyle has talked about um, a multitude of different phenomena occurring there, uh, not uh, discluding. Uh, UFO uh, occurrences around that property. And there was even a point in time where uh, when I was investigating there, I, I was standing outside with uh, Joey Jiggy Webb and Dan Hooven, and uh, we were looking up at the sky, and I see this thing moving at a ridiculous speed that was uh, so elevated you knew it wasn't a plane. It was way, way too fast, but it could have been a satellite. But uh, there's been claims of that. Uh, of course, uh, you hear some of the stories that Andrea Perrin spoke of, uh, the farmhouse and some of the alien encounters that went on there. Uh, is there some sort of a connection, and yet we've missed it because we've been keeping the uh, our eye on one part of this and not looking at a broader spectrum? You know, like we were talking last week, I, I really do think paranormal, This the, the ghost hunting part of it's kind of run its course. So it seems obvious that we're going to have to look at something else to start investigating and another another theory. And so I, I do not see why this will not come around and more people are going to get involved in this. I'm and First off, I also want to, uh, well, not first off, it's the second off. I, I want to agree with, with these cracks either being either man-made or, you know, UFOs, wherever. But I've always kind of wondered why, if, uh, if it is government issue or whether it's from, uh, from Mars, little green men operating them or whatever, why they put lights on them? If they don't want to be seen, shut off your damn lights. Uh, <laughs> it, doesn't, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but yeah, but another thing, the thing is that uh, I'm actually, I talked to uh, some friends this weekend, I'm actually going to put my paranormal ghost hunting on the back burner for a while, and, it's, and it started up at that, uh, the symposium in Chicago, where I've got such an interest in, in the, the UFO phenomenon now that I want to turn everything or my interests towards that. I'm going to like, I'm going to step aside from, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with my groups or anything, but I, I just, I want to, I want to move on. I want to get out there and see what's going on with this. That's a great, great way to start with whether there is a connection between UFOs and the spirit world. Well, I, I want to quickly go to Ashley because uh, he's been kind of uh, uh, silent tonight on this, and I'm sure a lot of it uh, comes to the fact that uh, he's trying to make heads or tails. Going from where you originated in this community with ufology, then going to spirit uh, uh, research, um, would you include or would you consider Ashley including, because you do the tours uh, nightly uh, there in Australia, that if you're doing perhaps your own private EVP session away from the groups, as an example, and would you start to include the question, are you an alien, and to see if there were responses there also? Well, yeah, it definitely doesn't hurt trying. Um, back in, it brings up an interesting point. Back when I very first started the ufology thing, that's where I very first came across shadow people. And shadow people are really, you know, quite heavily talked about in the ghost and haunting field. So there's definitely some parallels there for, for back in the UFO field it was thought they were some kind of alien entity. So it definitely does not help well hurt asking those questions and I think I think lots of people should give that a go and, and see where that might take them. I Why think not? that uh with the time remaining here too and I want to get back to Mike on something that he just mentioned. 
but um, give everybody, you, you just last week, the reason we didn't have you on the show was because you were in Sydney uh, working on a documentary. Uh, what can you divulge uh, to the listeners right now? Uh, you know, what's this in regards to and uh, when it's going to be available for viewing? Uh, yeah, so uh, for the past week I was in Sydney and I was filming our first documentary, which is known as Ghosts of Kasula, and it's set at an old uh, power station in Kasula, which is, well, in Sydney, Australia. And it, it started when I had a, a quite an interesting experience there back in, I think it was 2011, I should really know that off the top of my head by now. And and we, we've just wanted to tell the story of a location, and that's where we've kind of tried differentiating ourselves from a lot of other shows. Like, this isn't a show, this is a documentary, but we wanted to really tell a story about the location and not so much about, you know, just following people investigating. So we filmed a lot of reenactments of the deaths that we know about. We did investigate. We interviewed a lot of people um, that are very uh, relevant to the documentary and were also very important to the powerhouse in in its many guises over the years. And, yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's been really interesting. We've got an interesting story in it. And as for release, it's been premiered at the Australian Paranormal and Spiritual Expo in October 2014. And after that will be available on DVD. But as for getting it out to the international audience, we've, we've got some plans in place. Like, you know, we'd love to tour with it around the States and do some screenings. And, and things like that. So as for distribution internationally, we're still looking at that. Mr. Bowler, we'll close out with you tonight. Uh, you just posted something to me, private message, which said you found your place in the paranormal. Kind of uh, uh, quickly give a synopsis of that, and then get the lineup of the reporters for your debut show, Paranormal, paranormal Two uh, Channel Network, uh, this coming Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Well, finding my place in the paranormal, I've always been skeptical. Uh, I never got involved in the community or involved with the show to be the show skeptic, but it seems after the past couple of months of shows that uh, I, I like to say I'm the voice of reasoning. I, I, I don't want anybody to think I, I like to pick arguments or, or start a debate, but I, I simply want people to, to try to bring facts when facts are available, and if they're not, let's not call them facts if they're not, and that's kind of the direction I like to go in. And one of the things that we will do this Friday, and make sure and don't miss the premiere right here on Dead Air uh, through Blog Talk, of PCN, Paranormal Channel News, which is going to be a completely different format, guys. We're not going to have guests. We're not going to have interviews. Tracy Todd and William Peters, as you heard, are going to join me. Uh, Confirmed reporters, uh, Tracy Todd will be with us each month for weird and odd news to open up. But uh, on this premiere show, Faith Seraphin is going to bring paranormal history. Eric Altman on cryptozoology. Becca Shugart, uh, psychic and spiritual. Bob Gross will discuss UFOs. And Dwayne Favors on the science of the paranormal. So we're going to do uh, a lot of different uh, areas. It's it's going to be a quick, fast-paced show. Please be a part of this first one. And if you have any interest in being a reporter for PCN, please contact us through PCN, Paranormal Channel News, on Facebook. Uh, Pamela Croker on Facebook. You can get a hold of myself or George through the Dead Air Paranormal uh, radio Facebook page. And once again, that's at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, right here on Blog Talk through Dead Air Paranormal Radio. Very, very good. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, of course, Mr. Jim Heater, uh, Bridget uh, McDermott Good, Ashley Hall in Australia, uh, also uh, Paula Harris for taking the time to join us tonight. I really appreciate her input on this. Uh, and if you guys uh, get a chance tomorrow night, listen to World Awakening uh, with Andrew and myself, 9 p.m. to be customer, well, not customer appreciation night, but in a sense, all of our listeners. Uh, the foot soldiers, as Andrew called the people who listen to the shows are going to be calling in, giving their input on the first uh, five months that we've been doing the World Awakening, uh, and some of the things that topic-wise that we've addressed that they want to uh, respond to with us. So that'll be tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Wednesday night, Paranormal Kool Aid uh, with uh, Chris Medina and his incredible entourage. Uh, also f- on Thursday, uh, Paranormal Hood with Joey Jiggy Webb, and uh, of course on Sunday. Mr. Matthew Slozer, and Sunday night, Dad Matthew Slozer, of course, uh, is out of town the next two weekends. He's up at Rolling Hills Asylum, and he's out with his family. So we are so uh, happy to have him come back and talk to us about whatever experiences that he had while he was out there. But uh, we're almost out of time here, guys. I want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, we'll uh, see you next time. Until that time, thank you for listening. 
to Primetime Paranormal. Have a good night. Remember, keep the lights on. Take care.